everybody. This is AIPS and I'm Jura Osmitz, AIPS Secretary General and your moderator for today. This is first of four seminars with the team Women in Sports Medias. Today we will have the first one. There are more than 500 persons involved in this AIPS seminar from more than 100 countries sending requests for the last seven days and we are proud on that fact. So welcome you all. Some will join us later, some may be on other seminars, but welcome you all. Let me remind you just on a few facts before starting. During the entire seminar, please stay mute. If needed, we will unmute you by sending a question to allow us to unmute you. You must answer with yes if you want to be unmuted, by stay muted all the time. It means that the symbol of microphone down right on your screen must be crossed with red line. In the first part, we will listen, only listen our panelists. In the second part, it is your time. You can ask or discuss or just have an opinion. For that, you have to raise the hand virtually. Click on the participants button down the screen and on the left side of your screen, you will see not only the list of participants, but also the raise hand blue button you have to click on. Our staff will monitor it and let me know. I will give you the word. Please be aware that we have only three minutes per person, only three minutes, so be short and brief. About the translation, you get the instruction how to connect your mobile phone to Interprofy platform. So do it. Put your earphone in your ear and choose the language you want, English, Spanish, French or Arabic, and stay on it for the whole time of the seminar. Everything will be translated to that four languages. And now I think we can start. Your host is Mr. Johnny Merlo, AIPS president. Johnny. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Good morning to the people that are from the part of America and good night to the people that are on the part of uh, Japan. I think that this is a very special day. I'm very happy that we can dedicate three sessions of this seminar to women. We know that the problem is very big and everybody is discussing about this. What we can say as IPS is that usually in all our events, especially the Young Reporter Project, the number of women taking part is almost the 50%. So we are following exactly the new wave in the world. And of this, we are very proud because it means that the message that we send now I must thank also our mentor, Ricardo Romani, that has had the idea of this uh, seminar, because I think that it comes in the very difficult moment for the world, but it, it, in this difficult moment, we can find the new solution. And I think that we will come out from this crisis stronger than before. So for this reason, I want also to thank the, our colleague of the Association of Sport Journalists of Qatar that has accepted to put this special experiment with the four translation in four languages in, in the budget of the award because we are we have a special cultural program and this cultural program allowed us to invest in this new system of translation also on Zoom. This is very special, it's a challenge, and we are very happy that we can run this challenge. And for this reason, now, I thank you, everybody of you, to be with us, and also to be with us in the next days. I thank all the panelists, because especially the women that will speak after me are very important in the world of sport journalism. And especially also because in this moment, we, will, we want also to take one minute and a to promote our award that is growing so much and allowed us to have new possibility of organization. And for this reason now, good luck to everybody and let's see this video. Absolutely, yeah.
And this was only a few months ago. Johnny, you have to say something more about the award? Yes. Uh, I think that, sorry, that we can do a little bit later. Now we have had a small technical problem and we will be back later. Now we can, you can, you can continue with the program. Thank you very much, Johnny. Of course, we will continue because with us is uh, Evelyn Vata, AIPS Vice President. Evelyn, welcome and please hear your words. <laughs> Thank you, Yura. Hello, everyone. Hola a todos. Bonjour a tous. It's a very special moment because this is something we at AIPS had thought of over a long time, but then finally we are, re we are realizing it even in a bigger scale not only for sports journalists, but all women in the media. It's something that I really thank my colleague and AIPS mentor, Ricardo Romani, because what he has done for us is something that will stay in our history. It's something very important because over the next few days, we will hear from some great women who will share their experiences experiences that can be considered tough, experiences that should be able to probably distract you or make you slow down, but this has been their fuel. They have been threatened. Some of them have received uh, online abuses just because they're trying to relay the news to you. And these are the women we admire, and these are the strengths we want to showcase over the next four days throughout the seminar. They're not conversations that are new. They're conversations that we have had over the years. And I hope that this time with the AIPS, we will be able to just move, not even one step, move probably five steps because under representation, the gender gap, less pay, the abuse against women are things that I have heard from the time I joined the media, which is about 20 years ago. And it's time for us to move this conversation from always talking about equality. How can we break the ceiling to see how we can now move to equity? How can we get what is missing for the journalists of the world? Enjoy the rest of the days and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Eve, uh, and uh, thank you to all our participants that will now come to their minutes. Uh, first of them, from Australia, Tracy Holmes, senior reporter, ABC News. Tracy, we are very uh, happy to have you with us and warmly welcome you. Your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also want to say congratulations to AIPS for having this very important seminar. Um, thank you to all of the delegates who have registered. It's really fantastic to know that there are growing numbers of women that are working in this incredible sports industry right around the world. I'd like to offer my gratitude first to the panelists, um, Donna, Viviana, Maria, Inas, and my friend Wakako, because all of them are truly remarkable women for doing what they have done. So I applaud all of them and I hope you applaud them with me. Now, very briefly, I just want to say to all of you that you've made a wonderful choice to work in sports media, even though the industry is going through some tough times now. But then again, every industry is, and we will find a way because tomorrow always comes. Um, for me, I have the best job in the world as a journalist who gets to work in sport across TV, uh, radio and print. I've covered as a reporter and an anchor 12 Olympic Games, starting in Barcelona in 1992, three FIFA World Cup campaigns, the first one in France, 98, then Germany, 2006, and again in France last year for the Women's World Cup, plus many other international sports. I was Australia's first female anchor of a national sports program on the ABC beginning in 1991. And a couple of years before that, I was Australia's first female to be employed as a trainee broadcaster to report and commentate on live sport. Now, since then, I've been incredibly lucky to have worked for CGTN in China as an anchor, for CNN in the Middle East as a reporter, for Dubai Eye, SBS, and numerous other organisations. 
I met Wakako last century, um, which dates us. That was when I was the media information manager for the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games. And now I've done a full circle and I've come back to the ABC where I first started after living and working overseas for 14 years. So now I anchor international news and current affairs for the ABC three days a week. And um, Tracy, on two Tracy, days Tracy, week, Tracy, 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 yeah? please. Translators are, uh, are running behind okay. you. So <laughs> please, please be a little bit slower, please. Okay. So two days a week. I'm just aware of the time. I don't want to eat into no. other people's time. No, no, it's time. okay. <laughs> okay. So um, two days a week, I do a sports podcast called The Ticket, which looks at sports governance and issues like doping. I've also designed journalism programs and taught at a number of universities. But another aspect to my job is to travel to countries like the Philippines, India, Indonesia, and elsewhere, uh, where I've been lucky to train and mentor women, like some of the women that are on here today, uh, who also work in sport, but in countries where there are sometimes more challenges than in my own. Now, there's one lesson that I share um, that I would like to give to you today as well. And that is, you are not alone. So even if you are the only woman in the arena, or the only female at the press conference, or the only one on tour with a national team, all of us have been that only woman. We know what you're going through, and we're here to offer you strength. Sometimes you will be bullied. Sometimes people will laugh or make rude remarks. Sometimes people will question your right to be there or ask what you know. And almost every day, you will be abused on social media. But to that, I say, so what? When that happens, please try and remember this. The person that behaves that way is telling you a lot more about themselves than they're telling you about you. All they really know about is how you will react. So you have a choice. You can ignore them or you can take them on, but pick your fights wisely. You're there to do a job because you are capable of doing that job. And I bet in many instances, you are better than many of your male colleagues. You probably work harder, you probably research more, you commit more time and effort, and that you should be congratulated for. So be proud of your efforts, not disheartened by them. When young reporters I talk to, or, or the ones that I train, um, they talk to me about how they get abused on social media, I always ask them to show me the bruises. Are they here? Are they here? Are they here? Usually, there are none. It's not real. These people can only hurt you psychologically if you let them. Don't let them. If it upsets you to read what they write, don't read what they write. And if they accuse you of something, Ask yourself, am I, as they say, if the answer is yes, fix it, but usually the answer is no, so you have nothing to worry about. Now, people ask, when will this change? Ask Donna. She's been doing this since the 1960s. There are a lot more women doing the job now than when she first started. So many things have changed, but a lot stay the same. Most of the editor positions, or the heads of news or sports positions are still filled by men. And until there's substantial change and gender equity in those decision-making positions, then the challenges will remain for women who work as reporters. So in Australia, our first female sports reporter was a woman called Judy Joy Davies. Her first international assignment was the 1954 Commonwealth Games. Like Donna, she was an Olympic swimmer. She won a bronze medal at 1948 Olympics before becoming a reporter, which she did for 31 years. So we've had women working in sports media for almost 100 years in Australia, but still we're not paid the same and we don't get the same recognition. Earlier this year, the Australian government, uh, Australia Post, issued a series of stamps to recognise and celebrate Australia's legendary sports reporters. And guess what? All of them were men. However, for me personally, the way I look at it is like this. I think that I have, or we have, the best jobs in the world. Yes, I've worked harder than many others to get to where I am, but that's not something I'm angry about or troubled by. I'm also thankful to the men who've always employed me. Until six years ago, I had never had a female boss. So there are many men that I have to thank. They were the men that did pick me for teams and positions, 
and jobs that they promoted me to ahead of my colleagues who were men. So we have to recognize the good as well as the bad. And I'll leave you with two pieces of advice. And they're quite funny and, and they're quite simple, nothing philosophical. But somebody once told me, always dress like you're going to interview the president and then you'll stand out from the crowd. I also tell female reporters, if you're going into a mixed zone, wear the brightest color you have, wear the highest heels you can find, even though it's not comfortable, but guess what? You'll stand out from the crowd. And when athletes go by a thousand journalists and you are the one who stands out, you've got more of a chance of getting an interview than all of those men in gray suits. So just last week, I was paid a great compliment by an old colleague. He was an Olympic runner who's uh, now working in television. And he said to me, I have an admission to make. Do you remember the first time we worked together to do the commentary on the London 2012 Olympic Games opening ceremony? Yes, I said. Well, he said, I turned up without doing any research. When I got there and realised how much you'd done and the notes you had, I felt really embarrassed. But when you pushed your notes across to share them with me, so I didn't look foolish, that was the best lesson I ever had. So finally, let me say something to you. While ever we paint ourselves as women in sports media, the men will see us that way. So start thinking of yourself as a journalist, a commentator, an anchor, the same as the many others who just happen to be men. Once you see yourself as one of them, half the battle has been won. The other half of the battle is to get them to see you in the same way. Good luck. Thank you, Tracy. This was very interesting. And I think I will get some high heels for the next mix on. <laughs> <laughs> but now we will going to Egypt. Ines Maska, Deputy Editor-in-Chief and Head of Sports, Section al Aharam Weekly Newspaper. So, Ines, uh, welcome and uh, we are listening to you. Thank you so much for uh, having me with you and having such an opportunity. And Tracy, I really loved your uh, speech. It was so inspiring. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you see, I'm, I'm the head of the sports section of uh, El Ahram Weekly newspaper. And uh, I've been there since I started. So I've been my own boss. But then I worked with in other newspapers and other uh, places where, of course, all bosses were men. So I was the first female at the age of 22 or 23. I was the first female head of sports section in Egypt. That was lucky because it, it was an English language newspaper and nobody had uh, no no male people uh, came to the to work in it. So I was the first. So I became the head. So I want to say something now. If asked to name a new uh, to name a few of the most famous sports women in the world, most people who watch or play or read about sports can rattle off at least some names, like Serena Williams, uh, Simone Bills, Maria Sharapova, and so on. Uh, but for, for the same people, the task might uh, the, the, the task of listing the names of women journalists can, or the women working in the sports media, uh, can be uh, harder for them uh, in order uh, to remember our names. Uh, not always uh, they can. Uh, there simply aren't that many of the world repute, especially in the third world, that, and that is the crux here in the third world, in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, in trying to crack the glass ceiling it often looks like female sports journalists in print and broadcast must try harder uh, than their male counterparts. Uh, it's a subtle but damaging form of discrimination in which women cannot attain the opportunities they have in front of them, despite their suitability and their best efforts. If women's sports at a global level are progressing and spectator interest increasing in the world, it's safe to say that women in the media have definitely helped. Several sports women after retiring, like Donna, have signed on to work for TV and radio stations as commentators and newspapers as reporters, fields once entirely dominated by men. 
seeing a woman journalist or, or even a photographer on a sports field is now a familiar sight. Not too long ago, they were looked upon as intruders on the field, just as the first day I went to the stadium. Who are you? What are you doing in the Media Tribune? At the start of my 29-year career in the early 90s, I was told by some male colleagues to find myself another job where I would need only to sit at the desk and go home to my parents or my husband by midday. Some even suggested I quit altogether, get married and have children. I did not take the advice, I'm naughty, because I meant business. I was there to stay and I did. I took them by storm. I was everywhere, working in the newspapers, different newspapers, appearing on TV, uh, working in federations, uh, different federations, handball, football, uh, everywhere as media officer, as the match commissioner, everything I can do, I was doing to the extent that I remember uh, uh, at that time in the 90s, uh, the Egypt's uh, number one goalkeeper, who is now uh, Ahmed Choubeir, who is now a, a, a famous TV presenter, he works in the sports media. At that time, he said, Inas, you are everywhere. I believe if, if I open the oven, I'll find you inside. So this is how it went for the first nine years of my career, where I worked in sports media, I overcome obstacles of underrepresentation, sometimes by some coaches or by athletes who denied me uh, interviews, or even uh, some colleagues would uh, deny me uh, asking questions in press conferences. By, of course, sometimes they thought that questions coming from women would be trivial or unprofessional, that we are not there, that we are not serious. So, but I would insist that I should take my question. And to be honest, sometimes people or sometimes coaches and uh, athletes would be very, very cooperative and they would give me the floor first and they would say, let the lady, because I would be the only lady in the press conference. So sometimes it helps. Uh, so, but I never took no for an answer all my life, in the, all my 29 years. I forced myself in and was able to make a name for myself of sorts. Then I got married, probably because my mother has been pushing me after nine years. But I did not take this step until I was sure I had found a broad-minded and understanding individual. And while some believed that marriage and children would decrease my motivation, my journey continued and I maintained my successful streak. I stunned them by making a quick and a strong comeback. I worked very hard and traveled even while pregnant and resumed work immediately after the three month maternity leave which we have in Egypt. With two children, the next 20 years saw my career blossom as I confirmed my status in the field of sports media, thanks to some veteran male colleagues and bosses who supported me when realizing I was there not to compete with them, but rather to work together. And I want to tell you that in, tw in, 20, uh, in 1997, I was in Japan at the World Handball Championship, and there was elections for the Handball Commission in 1997. There were nine European members. All of them are men, and they were opening the floor for election for uh, a tenth member, preferably outside of Europe. And they didn't mention, is it a man or a woman? So I told them, I want to go into the election. And they said, you, where are you from? I said, from Egypt, from Africa, I'm African. So I went into the elections and there were other people from Asia also in the elections. And guess what? I won by elections. I mean, I wasn't appointed and that was really very nice. And to be honest, I was celebrated in my country. In 2010, my colleagues, journalists in Egypt said, Inas, we want you member of the Egyptian uh, Sports Press Association. Go into the elections. I said, I'm traveling. I, I was in London at the time. So guess what? They, they, they applied m for me, my name, and the elections took place in my absence, and I won. And guess what? From nine people, I got the highest votes. So this is because they believed in me. So 
and they appreciated and respected my seriousness, my ambition. Women journalists in Egypt have nowadays proven themselves, if not in covering male events, then in at least fighting for women's sports and trying to spread women's sports through reporting and covering them in detail. I've been working for three decades now, not only in my country, but the world over. At the beginnings, few women have managed to make significant inroads in sports media. Now it's rapidly changing for women journalists. From my tours all over the world and having attended several international events, I have seen this for myself. One example I still remember was in the 1998 World Cup in France. Male members of the media, as well as fans in the stands, were surprised to see a veiled woman photographer on the field. She was an Iranian Muslim. Neither her society nor her religion prevented this woman from working and trying to prove herself. In Egypt, in the early 1990s, we were only four women members in the Sports Press Association, along with 170 male colleagues. Now, we are around 40 women registered in the association, along with 600 male colleagues, not to mention women freelancers not officially registered. I believe that if women sport journalists are to succeed, they should work for it, fight for it, in order to prove themselves. No one is going to fight on our behalf. It is they, we women, and they alone, who must carve a niche for themselves among their male counterparts. I can assure you, as my experience attests, they will be most welcome, hopefully. These women are taking on a huge responsibility as they continue to fight what they and enlightened members of our society believe is right. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. I hope we will not uh, need any fights in the future, but to need to work together. And thank you for these uh, very good words. Thank you very much. And now we must go to Japan. Why? Because in Japan is a late, late, late night. And uh, Wakako Yuki, senior writer of the Yomiuri Shimbun, is waiting for us. Wakako, it's your turn. Thank you. Hello. Hope I, uh, you can hear me. Yes, of course. Good. And thank you indeed for um, letting me be uh, taking part of uh, this wonderful opportunity and this wonderful panelists. And I'm really, really looking forward to um, having a lot of um, um, views from the world, uh, from the participants, uh, men and women, on this topic which I uh, um, had in mind for quite some time. But actually, um, well, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, well, I'm uh, obviously senior writer, journalist, uh, working for uh, the Omiri Shimbun. Uh, and I have been covering uh, the Olympic Games, uh, Paralympic Games, or um, um, IOC, the IOC uh, issues for, um, I think, last 27 years. Um, in a way, um, I covered 13 Olympic Games, uh, eight Paralympic Games, and have a, um, issued a couple of books uh, regarding that, on that theme, as well as I was asked to give lectures at the universities, things so forth. Um, now I am a member uh, of a um, um, sports, sports agency, a Japanese government, um, sports Council, uh, which is an um, ad hoc committee uh, to create, help create uh, sports policy in Japan, as well as um, I'm the member of, um, for instance, Japan um, Olympic Academy. Uh, I was asked to um, uh, participate in various um, uh, symposium, things, so forth. But actually, um, I was to begin uh, sharing with you my quite humble origin as a sports journalist. Anyway, um, tell you, when I was asked to comment in this um, symposium um, forum, two things uh, came out to me uh, in terms of a Japanese situation. Uh, one is um, um, Japan being one of the worst country in OECD uh, in terms of um, gender gap in uh, leadership role especially, notably uh, within the companies and also in the governments. Um, actually, 
My company, the Yomiuri Shimbun, uh, is a well big newspaper, and um, it has um, um, well Guinness Book of World Records entry uh, for um, uh, the biggest newspaper in the world. We still have um, diminishing, but um, um, I think seven point five near eight uh, million uh, circulation a day for morning version alone, and. Another issue with the um, Japanese um, um, characteristic, apart from uh, these gender gap, uh, is that uh, it is we still keep somewhat life employment. Uh, I am with this Yomiuri Shimbun for around um, uh, 30 years or more, actually. And um, um, it is not uncommon for men or women uh, to be employed by a company until the days uh, your career is over. Now, in these kind of circumstances, there are uh, probably slight different um, issues or um, um, situation arise. Uh, for instance, I was smiling uh, when uh, Tracy was talking about, her mom, you know, you were that one uh, only woman. Yes, I was the only woman. And also, um, um, you know, in a way of um, fighting. Um, but at the same time, I start to feel that um, maybe if it's in Japan with a lifelong employment in a company where all the all, not only bosses, but your colleagues are mostly men, then uh, fighting may not lead you uh, much uh, to uh, what you what you aim as a goal so quickly. So um, I tell you how I began and I tell you how I tried myself to overcome those situations in Japan. It may actually uh, be shared, these kind of um, experience may be shared by many Asian and elsewhere uh, countries. Um, now, um, actually, I when I was first asked to be in the sports division of my company after several years of cadet. Uh, it was quite out of blue. Um, the editor-in-chief in sports came in uh, and actually picked me up and said, uh, well, um, Ms. Yuki, you'll be joining our sports division from next week. I was like, oh, what? Because I... <laughs> Uh, to be honest, I never enlisted uh, my interest in sport. And uh, I was um, um, uh, quite rather shocked and, and curious, asked uh, the situation and why. And he said, yeah, uh, we sports division had one uh, female journalist before, but um, um, she quit. Uh, she didn't last for a year. So you are the second trial. And, uh, uh, well, why? Because uh, we definitely need someone who can enter female athletes' rocker room. That was like, yeah, okay. That's why I was picked. Well, I was a swimmer until university, things so forth. So I may uh, look to be qualified um, in, the, in the eyes of those um, um, gentlemen. Uh, now, I was a bit unnerved, but told myself, I am not go anywhere. I probably have to spend time as a journalist with Yomi Shimbun. And uh, yes, I'll try to aim at at least three things. First one is um, to try to like my work. Uh, because I told myself that um, you cannot really dislike something uh, instantly uh, without knowing it in depth. Uh, I should learn to like it. And to me, the field of sport turned out to be quite, you know, um, wonderful area uh, to cover wealth of um, human stories uh, and social and um, international topics. Um, some told me that probably sports is um, one of the very rare topic within our society, which a journalist can write positive stories a lot. True. Although I write about doping as well. Um, now, two. Find something. Uh, no one is so much 
keen to cover it and find a place for myself. Um, and here I have to give my apology to the IOC president, Thomas Bach, because um, the IOC coverage was just that. Um, in a way, back in 1990s, early 1990s, within my company at least, uh, IOC coverage requires obviously foreign language command and um, um, discussions after discussions after meetings, for instance, may not have appealed to my colleagues, male colleagues, who loved football, who loved uh, baseball, sumo wrestling, and so forth. Um, hence, uh, I started to put my hands and try to cover interviewing President Samranj at that time was my first task. Um, it turned out to be, a, I found it rather intriguing because before joining sports division, my uh, um, aim as a journalist was um, um, to promote intercultural understanding. And actually, it was quite similar. Third, um, find your own view, which is difficult. You have to have lots, lots of um, experience first, and then uh, your own actually um, ideal to be formed. Uh, and so, hence, I, which I'm still working on, it seems. Um, I am trying to see, for instance, sports for its value and social significance. Um, but these, I think, uh, are quite meaningful. And I thought, um, um, because of these kind of goal, I thought um, um, covering sports could be my lifelong uh, life work in a sense and in a way um, so I was um, happened to be assigned as a, a leader of a um, uh, one of the leaders but um, basically ideal uh, giving out idea and um, also writer editor uh, everything for a project yet last year uh, thanks partly to the Olympic Games uh, and I was um, um, trying to write a series of long articles throughout the year uh, with my project team uh, to give that idea to my, uh, my readers. Uh, what is the value of sports? What is the significance to our lives, our body, our mind, uh, social cohesion, things so forth. Uh, each theme dedicated to each uh, kind of question. Uh, that I had in my mind long time. And um, actually, it, it was received quite well in Japan. Thanks for that. Um, also, of course, uh, because of the postponement of um, um, 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, I am still forming my visions or views, what is sports and what is the value of it. Now, um, to sum up, um, what I have tried, as you saw, uh, throughout my life uh, to overcome the situation may not be a confronting squarely uh, uh, the you know, prejudice or the situation, uh, especially, as I said, in Japanese culture and lifelong employment, uh, we tend to feel or that confrontation may only give you short-term gain. Uh, of course, on the other hand, that could be the reason, very reason for Japan to remain in a dishonorable, uh, dishonorable position within the OECD for such a long time. But anyway, what I tried instead uh, within my company or within as journalist was to prove that a female journalist has quality, uh, deep understanding, reliable, uh, and surprisingly for that, I had um, unexpected allies uh, amongst a um, lot of male colleagues, leadership, being so forth, uh, which is good. Also, I was so happy after my case, uh, the number of female journalists, sports journalists within uh, my company increased. And okay, welcome. They were, yes. Okay, thank you for this uh, uh, nice formula from Japan. I think it can be used in all over the world. I'm sure in, in that. 
All right. And uh, uh, allow me to sum up. Yes, 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 yes. And so basically, um, I created small change. And uh, although I have never, ever entered female athletes locker room before uh, in my life. And one of the things, a change in society usually occurs if it is considered as benefiting to the society or entity or company for that for that case. So um, probably we may need to give data, facts, what we face today to share that knowledge overall and then have some kind of paradigm shift to that direction, uh, how we see beneficiary of the society can be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vagako. It is a very inspiring words. Now we will go to Spain. Ms. Maria Angeles Samperio Martin, president of the Gender Council of the International Federation of Journalists. And also, she is an editor of El Daira Montañez. She is from Spain, and of course, she will speak Spanish. Buenos días. Eh, lo primero, agradecer a la Asociación Internacional de la Prensa Deportiva la posibilidad de intervenir en este evento, que me parece especialmente interesante en estos momentos complicados que estamos viviendo toda la sociedad y de la que los periodistas somos una parte importante. Eh, como bien ha dicho Jenny, Jenny perdón, eh, soy la presidenta del Consejo de Género de la Federación Internacional de Periodistas. Este consejo eh, forma parte de una organización que representa a más de 600.000 profesionales en todo el mundo y que está especialmente interesada en avanzar en el campo del periodismo, tanto en el desempeño profesional como en evitar la brecha salarial y favorecer el acceso a puestos directivos de las Miss mujeres. María, más María, Miss María, sí. please, a little bit slower, a yes. little bit slower, please. Our translators are running around you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Um, como decía, el Consejo de Género de la Federación Internacional de Periodistas está especialmente interesado en avanzar en la igualdad en el campo del periodismo, tanto en el desempeño profesional como en evitar la brecha salarial y favorecer el acceso a puestos directivos de las mujeres periodistas. Y, por supuesto, en todo lo que tenga que ver con el acoso sexual en las redacciones y en la calle y también con el ciberacoso. Esta preocupación se ha incrementado en los últimos tiempos en el campo del periodismo deportivo. Así, en el último congreso de la Federación Internacional de Periodistas, que se celebró en Túnez en 2019, se aprobó ya una moción relacionada con las mujeres periodistas en el ámbito deportivo. La moción fue presentada por la Unión Sindical de Periodistas, CFDT, de Francia. Os leo el texto. Observando que en el Brasil unas 50 periodistas... A little bit slower. Yes. El texto. Observando que en el Brasil unas 50 periodistas deportivas han lanzado una campaña en las redes sociales contra el machismo imperante, déjala trabajar, es decir, déjala trabajar, y que en Francia más de 400, 400 mujeres periodistas francesas han lanzado el movimiento Nustus o MeToo para denunciar el sexismo y la violencia sexual en los medios de comunicación, la desigualdad profesional y salarial entre mujeres y hombres periodistas. La moción dice eh, hacer un llamamiento a las federaciones deportivas de todo el mundo para que lancen campañas de prevención para condenar enérgica y públicamente los ataques contra las periodistas, especialmente cuando son mujeres. Alentar a todos los gobiernos a que, a través de los ministerios competentes, tomen medidas para denunciar la violencia contra las mujeres en el ejercicio de su profesión de periodistas. Tercero, pedir a todos los sindicatos y organizaciones del mundo que reflexionen sobre la manera de proteger mejor a las mujeres periodistas con miras a adoptar medidas para lograr. Eh, a esta, esta moción se llegó por algunos ejemplos que me gustaría comentar. Por ejemplo, desde el Consejo de Género hemos seguido con preocupación algunos ejemplos como el de la copresentadora Clementine Sarlat del programa Estadio 2 de France Television, que fue retirada del mismo por motivos claramente sexistas, como denunció la afectada en una entrevista que concedió al equipo esta pasada primavera. En la entrevista contó que en enero de 2018 la retiraron de copresentar 
porque decían que no salía bien por las luces y las cámaras, lo que sí pudo hacer su colega Matthew. Después, cuando pidió un aumento salarial, le dijeron que se hiciera indispensable para poderlo conseguir. Por cierto, su compañero Matthew sí que lo logró. La periodista dice hoy que lloró mucho, señalando la cosa que sufrió. Nadie me hablaba. Me pusieron en una oficina separada, lejos de los redactores. Tuve que utilizar mi portátil para poder acercarme y entender de lo que íbamos a hablar. La periodista, que es especialista en rugby, explica que se la desacreditaba constantemente al decirla que no era competente y que solo estaba allí porque era rubia y tenía los ojos verdes. Clementín dejó France Televisión en octubre de 2018 antes de unirse a Bain Sport y luego a la TF1 para la Copa del Mundo de Rugby de 2019. Tras esta entrevista, la dirección de France Television de, eh, anunció que había abierto una investigación interna. Comentaron, de acuerdo con el principio de tolerancia cero aplicado rigurosamente dentro de la empresa, se está llevando a cabo una investigación para arrojar luz sobre los hechos mencionados. Estas fueron las declaraciones de la, de la televisión pública a la Associated Television Press. De otro lado, 52 mujeres periodistas de, de deportes de Brasil lanzaron una campaña para reunir informes sobre los incidentes de agresiones, acoso que se habían sufrido tanto en las salas de redacción o las redacciones como en el campo de juego. El movimiento está ganando fuerza. El movimiento Me Too ha tenido repercusión en numerosas industrias y en el periodismo no es una excepción. El grupo este de reporteras, como antes comentaba, creó el hashtag Deisela Trabajar, Dejarla Trabajar, en las redes sociales para denunciar estos casos de acoso, de falta de respeto y violencia que han sufrido en el simple desempeño de su trabajo de periodismo deportivo. La campaña comenzó con un vídeo en el que presentadores, asesores y periodistas hablaban de la violencia y el acoso que habían sufrido en el trabajo y exigían respeto tanto del público como de los colegas. El vídeo se mostró por primera vez en un partido de fútbol en el estadio de Maracaná de Río de Janeiro ante una audiencia de 79.000 espectadores. Mientras tanto se ha hecho viral en los medios de comunicación social. Estos son dos ejemplos que me parecen importantes y fueron los que motivaron la moción que, como comentaba, se aprobó en el Congreso de Túnez. Por otra parte, creo que la poca presencia de los deportes femeninos en los programas deportivos y en los medios de comunicación en general influye de forma negativa en la percepción que las mujeres, de las mujeres en los deportes y contribuye a mantener los estereotipos sexistas. Las mujeres participan de forma muy activa en los diferentes deportes, pero no tienen la misma visibilidad en los medios ni reciben los mismos sueldos. Por último, también me gustaría compartir que la Federación Internacional de Periodistas acaba de aprobar su propio código de conducta para evitar todas las situaciones de acoso y desigualdad. Ya ha pedido a los sindicatos y organizaciones que forman parte de la misma que se doten de estas herramientas. En definitiva, como periodistas, creemos que hay que trabajar por la igualdad en las redacciones, en la calle, en las redes sociales y en el mundo del periodismo deportivo, perdón, y el mundo del periodismo deportivo tiene que avanzar y superar el machismo que todavía se percibe. Desde el Consejo de Género de la FIT ofrecemos nuestra colaboración para mejorar esta situación. En muchos países, como por ejemplo en España, la Federación de Asociaciones de Periodistas, en la, de la que yo formo parte, tiene estrechas relaciones con las asociaciones de periodistas deportivos, muchos son miembros de ambas organizaciones y yo creo que es un tema que se puede trabajar así en los diferentes países. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much because it was very very good and uh, I'm sure that uh, in the future we will uh, cooperate much uh, closer than we cooperated uh, until now. Thank you very much for this and we will stay in uh, Spanish but we will go to Argentina. Viviana Villa, sport journalist, TV commentator, university lecturer is with us. Viviana, welcome. Buenas tardes, gracias por, por esta convocatoria, eh, me siento muy honrada de ser parte de este panel, muy halagada por, por querer escucharme y poder compartir además con ustedes, 
este, con quienes nos estén escuchando y con este, estas colegas este momento. Espero poder representar también el sentimiento de las argentinas, que es mi país, y pienso también en las latinoamericanas, aunque por lo que estoy escuchando compartimos eh, muchos sentimientos, muchas vivencias, este, y ahí nos sentimos emparentadas. Bueno, mi nombre, como me han dicho, Viviana Vila es, soy periodista de la Argentina, y entre mis actividades destaco la de ser eh, comunicadora en radio y en televisión, y mi trabajo más relevante, por lo cual eh, por ahí en el mundo han cautivado la atención, es la de ser una analista, comentarista de fútbol. Y en este marco, bueno, la verdad es que tengo el privilegio de trabajar con grandes figuras de, de mi país, que son, y esto me parece importante para el trayecto de una también, son honorables más allá de la profesión. Y este es un detalle que yo considero prioritario. Más allá de las cualidades profesionales, las cualidades humanas. Porque eso nos ayuda a transitar un camino eh, más digno y más libre. Eh, les cuento que toda mi vida está construida alrededor de la Universidad Nacional de La Plata, en la República Argentina. Eh, en la universidad me formé, eh, en la universidad soy docente, y esto lo subrayo porque le doy mucha importancia a eh, la conjunción de la formación académica y la práctica profesional. Me parece muy interesante este punto. Eh, llego a este encuentro no solo para contarles eh, el privilegio de haber eh, trabajado, de trabajar en lugares muy importantes, esto de ser en mi país la única mujer comentarista de fútbol en la televisión argentina, y además ser eh, de habla hispana la primera mujer, según me lo han dicho, eh, yo no lo sabía, que he comentado un mundial masculino de fútbol, esto fue en Rusia 2018, eh, para la cadena Telemundo de Estados Unidos, y además estuve en el mundial femenino del año pasado en Francia. Bueno. La experiencia con Telemundo ha sido una maravillosa experiencia personal y profesional. Por eso ratifico esto de la unión de lo personal y lo profesional, porque es realmente lo que yo valoro fuertemente. Esta ajustada, estrecha síntesis de mi tarea muestra la parte exitosa, la parte trascendente, pero bueno, sepan que es después de un largo camino, un sinuoso camino, que es imposible de sintetizar en pocos minutos, ¿no? Eh, digo, no es tan senc es sencillo contar eh, emociones, recuerdos, situaciones que eh, una mujer tiene que recorrer para, bueno, en ese camino para atravesar todos los sueños con profesionalismo, con pasión, con dignidad, con coherencia. Ese camino tiene muchas miradas que bloquean el horizonte, muchos actos que van derribando proyectos y muchas decisiones que provocan angustia. Eh, además, eh, los medios son manejados casi en su totalidad por hombres. Y recién ahora estamos asistiendo a una apertura más democrática para con las mujeres. Pero no fue fácil, no fue sencillo. Cuando yo empecé hace muchos años, era una mujer disruptiva y feminista. Pero en soledad. Y fue duro, fue ingrato, porque naturalizaba maltratos, naturalizaba situaciones, frases, comentarios, dichos de compañeros, eh, y eso está muy mal. Hoy veo cuánto mal estaba aquello. Bueno, hoy desde mi posición ganada, eh, 
en este terreno, asisto a, a un momento donde hay un colectivo femenino que gana espacios, que levanta su voz, que toma decisiones, es diferente a hace unos años atrás, 20 años, por ejemplo. A mí me tocó subir una escalera peldaño a peldaño, una escalera que es muy alta, por cierto, pero no he salteado un solo peldaño. Y si bien es más larga, cargada de obstáculos, me permite nunca olvidar cuál fue mi primer paso y disfrutar cada logro, elegir cada momento. Cuando algún colega eh, muy prestigioso o un medio internacional me convoca para trabajar, me llena de orgullo, me pone en la enorme responsabilidad de prepararme mucho para estar a la altura de las circunstancias, por respeto a mí, por respeto a, a quien cuenta conmigo para ese trabajo, quien me ha contratado, y por respeto a una audiencia que observa, que juzga. Y cuando nos juzgan, sentimos que posa sobre nuestro cuerpo una gran lupa, una lupa muy gigante, eh, y que cualquiera siente que es el dueño de esa lupa, que nos examina, nos observa, nos analiza, y nos maltrata muchas veces porque sentimos que tenemos que explicar cada uno de eh, los pasos que damos, cada uno de nuestros actos, nuestras opiniones. Hay una platea masculina que interpela y que sentencia, y eso es cruel también. Eh, mi vida profesional eh, es ser comunicadora mucho más allá del análisis del fútbol. ¿eh? Este, y aunque por todo lo que viví eh, pagué un alto costo también, mi compromiso se va renovando, se extiende a, a cada uno de, de los espacios en los que me toca trabajar, que van mucho más allá del fútbol. Amo el deporte y amo la comunicación social. Es una forma de ser y de sentir. Me gustaría decirles, ya finalizando, que soy mamá. Mamá de un adolescente, pero cuando ese adolescente era pequeño, se crió con una mamá que hacía una actividad distinta a otras mamás, y que implicó que yo deba adaptarme a todas esas actividades que ya conté, criando sola a ese niño. Valentino es un hijo maravilloso, porque entendió, acompañó, se cría con los valores de la igualdad, de la justicia, de los derechos humanos, de las mujeres con poder, y ese compromiso que yo le transmití hace crecer a hombres eh, que no sean machistas y que estén desconstruidos. Cuando hablo con colegas jóvenes, cuando hablo con alumnos en la universidad, les cuento que el camino es difícil pero que nunca abandonen sus sueños, que nada es más placentero que distinguir qué hacer para ser felices y a partir de allí poder elegir, porque saben que eso es la libertad. Muchas gracias. I think Valentino is a very happy boy. So Thank you very much, Viviana. Stay with us uh, and stay with us, all of you, because uh, soon, very soon, we will have the floor for our uh, listeners, for our uh, seminar uh, pupils, as I can say. But before that, please put your right hand blue button in the left side of the screen and uh, do it uh, properly, because uh, until now we only have questions from social media. Last one from the panelists is Donna De Varona double Olympic gold medalist, sport broadcaster, and gender equality activist from USA. Donna, welcome. Well, I just want to thank APES and the leadership of this organization for taking the stand that we should discuss in depth the whole role of women in journalism or the whole role of diversity and how it plays out in our universe, which we're understanding now when this virus has in many ways had us thinking deeper than ever before. I also want to thank Tracy and Enos and Yuki and Maria and the other two journalists uh, for their presentations. Tracy's was so motivating um, and she touched on so many important attributes of what it takes, male or female, to make it in this world of journalism. 
uh, Enos, I thought, was very um, articulate about bringing her culture to us and what it means to work in an environment where fighting uh, isn't always the best way, but proving your point through policy, through research, is the best way to change a culture. I know we try to do that in the United States um, as far as research and showing how women's athletes have progressed um, and what that means after retirement. Um, uh, the foundation sports gives us is significant as athletes and it gives us the attributes to probably have the endurance and goal setting and belief and passion uh, in our, our, our profession uh, to continue when we have those obstacles. Um, uh, I, I think that um, all of us know as women journalists, in many ways we put our family, uh, career, our family uh, goals aside. I didn't get married till I was 39 because I was so busy working on so many levels. And that's another thing that struck me with the speakers was, you know, you can't just be a journalist. You have to be totally immersed in the world of sport. And if you care about women in sport or women in journalism, uh, activism, taking roles of leadership where you can impact policy is very important. And again, uh, the bottom line is if you don't have women as decision makers, uh, giving out assignments, um, trying to make the landscape different, um, you're not going to get very far. And influencing the decision makers on who gets to write the story, what stories emerge is very important. I was asked uh, because I came from a world where there were no women in uh, sports journalism that I knew in my country uh, to talk a little bit about my journey from the pool to the broadcast booth. So I'm going to begin in 1964 in Japan. Uh, that was my Olymp second Olympics. And I participated in what I don't think the Japanese have ever been given credit before for in the state of the art Olympics. Um, from the ashes of the war, this country built up an incredible uh, passion because they felt they wanted their people to get pride and, and reach out to the world after World War II. And they bet the ranch, as they say, uh, if they put everything on the line to host the Olympics. After I won my second gold medal, I went back to that incredible swimming pool, indoor swimming pool, and climbed all the way up to the highest tower to look out at have a last glimpse of where I had made history as a swimmer. I was just 17 years of age and I had broken some 18 world records and fastest times in swimming. Um, my young years had been goal driven, rewarding and predictable. But as I looked out, I realized that in just one day, when I decided to retire, my life would completely change all at once. And looking back, that experience helped motivate me to create organizations to help athletes make that transition because it is a very difficult transition when you only know one way of life. And those experiences, I think, are what helped me in the broadcast booth as I began my career. My future at that time was a blank canvas. The sportsmen of my era in every sport were offered scholarships to attend universities where they could extend their uh, careers for four more years. Women of my generation faced no such opportunity and our option was to retire, to, to uh, figure out how we could get a, 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 an education. My family was not wealthy and so uh, for me, my future was a blank canvas. Also, it was a time of amateurism. So if you accepted money from anyone, uh, you were, had to retire because that was seen as professionalizing your sport. That was another um, experience that motivated me to change the system. It left a, a, a deep impression on me that while the men of my generation were honored for winning gold medals, for some reason, ours were less valuable. So I decided at the age of 17 that my option, only option, because I was getting offers, because I had become visible in my country, was to um, retire from my sport. Um, 
But also I didn't realize too that um, I was caught in time, place and circumstance in our country, much like it is today. It was full of time, place and political uh, activism. The anti-war demonstrations, uh, the uh, civil rights movement, the feminist movements were all bubbling up at the same time. And I eagerly took my place in it. It would take years, but step by step in education, business, sports, and in the arts, women were advancing. They were advancing quickly because we were speaking with one voice. This was done through advocacy, which we talked about, all our journalists have, federal legislation, policy, and activism. I often left my uh, world of journalism and took time off to work in the US Senate. Uh, and, and during this time, the television industry was evolving with only three main network companies operated in the United States. The newest company, the American Broadcasting Company, was determined to compete with the two other rival stations. ABC did not have the financial resources to pay for expensive rights fees to America's bread and butter sports, football, baseball, basketball. So one very creative producer, a man named Rune Arledge, a fan of Olympic sports, created Wide World of Sports, which featured a combination of car racing and offbeat sports, coupled with sports like athletics, swimming, gymnastics, skating, and skiing. The rights fees were very cheap. He also believed fan interest was star-driven. In 1961, during the inaugural Wide World of Sports broadcast, ABC covered my record-breaking win in the 400 individual medley. The network had found its star in me. Leading up to the Tokyo Olympics, ABC covered many of my races with lengthy interviews to follow. I was lucky. Eventually, I began to work hand in glove with the show producers. Tracy talked about sharing her research. I learned early in the pool that um, if I worked with the producers and helped them understand my sport, I could elevate the sports. So therefore, after retiring from swimming, it was apparent to me that I should continue to work with ABC. But there were no women that looked like me. There were no women broadcasters. But because I had these relationships, I felt that I could leave competitive swimming if I reached out to the network and asked them if I could work with them. I was 17, the network did not want to turn me professional, and so they made me wait for the decision when I asked them if I could work on swimming. Months later, I, had, I became the youngest and first woman to work in network sports at 17. In all, my journey took me to cover some 18 Olympics summer and winter, as well as numerous other sports and events, earning a coveted Emmy which is the highest award in the United States. Yes, it all seemed too easy. And at first, there is no doubt my fame and sports accomplishments opened the door for me. Many athletes try to take that step. However, although I was respected as a hardworking expert on my sport, making the transition into broadcasting, writing and working on other sports breaking news stories and documentaries took over a decade and I did not make a living wage until 10 years later. Uh, I spent my time doing other things, giving clinics, working in politics, uh, writing and speaking. And I also left ABC two times out of frustration. In between, I worked with both CBS and NBC and TNT and CNN. In my role as a sports activist, which basically I've done more progressive work in that world, I think, than I ever has a, have as a journalist. I joined up with other elite women athletes in creating the Women's Sports Foundation, serving as its first president and chairman. We gathered all the elite women to work together in this foundation because our US Olympic Committee had no commission that focused on women's sports. And we needed to have an independent organization outside the system to influence the decision makers. We got people to do the research about the value of sport, as um, Yuki talked about, and how that related to education and um, job promotion later on. We also worked with other athletes in 
pressing the International Olympic Committee to bring women and athletes on board. And we also did the same with our own US Olympic Committee. These experiences, even though I did not realize it at the time, gave me an advantage over my male television colleagues who did not have the contacts or intimate knowledge of the politics, personalities, and emerging stories within the inter and US sporting community as I did. So volunteering and getting active gave me resources that were very important. Therefore, in 1983, when I was summoned back to ABC after being out of the network for a long seven years, I brought with me a unique and valuable perspective. Finally, the very colleagues who had told me a women's voice had no credibility in sports gave me the kind of respect I yearned for. Those of us joining for this seminar in varying degrees have been told the same myths. We have worked for less pay, been given the unseen and uncredited work in editing, writing, and finding stories. We have pitched ideas and have been turned down only to find out those stories have been given to our male colleagues to report and produce. We've had to be creative, in, as Yuki mentioned, in finding those stories that maybe the men do not want to be doing or are interested in and making them and elevating those stories. As an AP, APIS, AIPS journey member and former women's full-time journalist, I know in my heart that women's voices have been absent for way too long. I also know that without a woman's voice, we have missed too many important stories. For years as a member of the IOC Women in Sport Commission, I have been advocating for policies aimed at dealing with abuse and harassment in sport. Policies that should have been implemented many, many years ago. The IOC has also undertaken an extensive review regarding not only how women are portrayed during Olympic broadcast, but the hours and placement devoted to the coverage of women. The challenge, of course, is convincing the various media outlets to adopt the IOC recommendations. It is important to recognize that what has prompted policy has been the reporting of abuses and the full-blown Me Too movement globally, as well as the hundreds of women who have found the courage to speak out. And finally, there are journalists that want to cover those stories in depth. Truth is, without a woman's voice, would we have learned in detail about the abuse of the many of the Afghan women's football players? Probably not. Or about the long-held secret scandals involving the U.S. women's gymnastics team, which was held hostage by Dr. Nasser and the United States Gymnastics Federation? Would we have felt the frustration and joy of a group of brave women's football fans who were promised entry into Iran's iconic football stadium? We were able to take the journey with them because of a female writer who felt passionate about entry into uh, football. If I have learned anything from my life's journey in sports, it is that although progress has taken way too long, it is possible to make change happen. However, it takes the relentless, unified voices of support from both men and women. You are those voices, and I'm honored to share my story with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It was very inspiring. And uh, uh, probably your part of this uh, panel is uh, motivating our people to ask questions, because <laughs> we have some questions. Uh, I'm uh, happy of that. And uh, first of all, it will be a man from Malaysia, Yasni Shafi. Yasni Shafi from Malaysia has a question. Please, Yasni, let us hear your question. Just to remind you, you have to confirm that you want to be unmuted and then you can speak. Yasni is maybe not with us anymore. Okay, we are going to India. Subod Mala Barun. Subod Mala Barun from India also have a question for us. Please do not forget to unmute yourself to confirm on your screen that you want to be unmuted when you ask the question, before you ask the question. Subod from India. <laughs> we don't have lucky with men. Oh, he's with us. Subod. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Talk to us. Subot, do you have a question? Subot has uh, maybe a question, but didn't hear it. Don't hear us. So let's go to a woman. Maybe we will have uh, much more uh, luck with women. Hiba Sabag from Jordan. Our next panelist will be. Hello, everyone. I'm Hiba Sabag from Jordan. I will speak in Arabic, so maybe. Yes, you can no. do it because we have translation for four thank languages. You very much. So thank you very much. بصراحة أنا فخورة جدا 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 استمعت لكل التجارب من زميلاتي من الدول التي تحدثوا من خلالها أشعر اليوم بالفخر أشعر بالتقدير على وجود سيدات متخصصات في الصحافة الرياضية على هذا القدر من المسؤولية والمهنية بصراحة ما شدني بالموضوع بأن التحديات واحدة التجارب واحدة المشاكل واحدة ما تحدثوا ما يحدث في دولهم يحدث في بلدي بصراحة أريد أن أشكر الجميع وأحييهم على ما قاموا به من مبادرات ومن جهود في دولهم وبصراحة أوجه الدعوة للاتحاد الدولي للصحافة الرياضية أن أخرج من بعد هذه ورشة العمل بمبادرة دولية ندعم فيها بعضنا البعض من خلال كل التحديات التي تم الحديث عنها سواء فيما يتعلق بالتمثيل فيما يتعلق بالمساواة بين الجنسين فأتمنى بالفعل الخروج بمبادرة دولية نستطيع من خلالها إيصال صوتنا أستطيع أن أدعم زميلتي في الأرجنتين أو إسبانيا أو الولايات المتحدة وأحتاج أيضا أن يدعموني أنا وزميلاتي في المنطقة العربية فأشكر الجميع وأتمنى أن تلقى هذه المبادرة اهتمام من قبل الاتحاد الدولي للصحافة الرياضية Thank you very much for these nice words and uh, I'm so happy that you are with us and you will be with us on the next seminars now we will go to El Salvador. Areli Franco had a question, I think. Areli. Uh, hola. Yeah. Eh, buenos días. Voy a hablar en, en español. Gracias por la oportunidad. It would be nice to see you, Areli, if it's possible. Uh, no tiene cámara mi, mi computadora. Lo siento. Okay. Le llevo mi Just ask the question. Okay, no problem. Primero, pues, gracias por la oportunidad y luego decir desde que mi propia experiencia comenzó en el deporte siendo yo atleta, ya que vengo de una familia que practicó el atletismo por mucho tiempo, lo cual me dio la oportunidad de representar a mi país como seleccionada en diferentes eventos deportivos internacionales, el máximo de ellos Atlanta 96, el cual desafortunadamente no tuve un buen resultado y ni siquiera solo el deportivo, sino que los medios de comunicación me atacaron por ese resultado. Okay, already. Uh, is it all? Yes, it is. Okay, uh, can we go to Russia now? Kozina is with us. Hola, hola, perdón. Hello, hello to everyone. Yes. Is everything okay? Uh, um, yes, yes. Uh, do you hear me? Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, hello to everyone. My name is Anna Kozina. I'm a sports journalist uh, from Russia, and uh, I, uh, I'm also the uh, FINA Media Committee uh, Chair. Uh, so, I have um, yes, uh, some uh, remarks. Yeah. Uh, for, yeah. for for example, uh, on the statistics uh, mentioned um, in the announcement of the topic of today's discussion, uh, that uh, uh, women are in the minority in uh, top uh, journalist roles, uh, despite making the majority of uh, journalism students. 
And to my mind, these statistics uh, does not indicate properly the situation, at least uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, so based on my experience, I can say the following. Uh, I graduated from Lomonosov State University, uh, Faculty of Journalism in 2005. And um, uh, recently we had an online meeting uh, celebrating 15 years of graduating uh, date. Uh, so um, uh, the real statistics is uh, uh, 300 students were accepted on to a course uh, and only uh, 20 or 30 of the whole amount were male students. And according to the uh, information um, that I got during the, our uh, online meeting, um, almost all of the male students are successful in journalism or in closed professions. Uh, as um, entering the faculty of journalism, they had a, des a real desire, a goal to, to become reporters, editors, and uh, so on. And as for the female students, uh, they considered the faculty of journalism uh, as a good basic education in the humanities. And this is uh, the situation like uh, uh, in Russia. I don't know whether it's good or not, but uh, it is like this. It is very, uh, very good. We would like to publish it if you have it uh, right. And, uh, and uh, we would like to have this, uh, these uh, statistics and uh, publish uh, it's, it. On it's our not the official statistics. Is, uh, it's just um, my thoughts uh, on, on, on the situation and my, my thoughts on what I know anyway, about we my... we can publish your thoughts. Yeah. Oh, okay, ah, please, okay, write, yeah. write it. Uh, yeah, and, and one more thing, uh, if you allow uh, me, yes, uh, yes, speaking about the leading roles uh, for female journalists, um, for those who, who, are, who are in the profession. Uh, so some years ago, I was elected as a FINA Media Committee, uh, FINA Media Committee Chair, and I think that um, this is a good sign in terms of uh, the problem we are discussing. But uh, I, 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 must, uh, I must say that uh, the ex-chairman, uh, Camille Cometti from Italy, he was a, a great professional and he was a right man in the right place. And uh, I try my best to follow his steps. Uh, and um, I also have to mention that uh, now uh, the majority uh, of uh, the members of the committee are also men. It's uh, eight uh, men against four women. But uh, I believe that uh, working in the committee is not, uh, you know, a competition between uh, sexes uh, and it's a teamwork. And um, we, I, to my mind, we don't have uh, such a problem uh, in the committee. Um, and it's, uh, we, and we, we also have, uh, we also... Okay, Anna, I agree with you and yeah. thank you for your three minutes. Thank uh, you, thank you so much. Write, write you. an article for AIPS web and uh, we will be glad to publish it. And uh, now we are going to Nigeria. Ario is with us, or maybe he's not, but I think it is. Ario from Nigeria. Okay. Hello. Yes, Aria, we are listening to you. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm sorry about the apologies for the camera. No problem. I I would like to just chip in, like as an inexperienced media person here in Nigeria. Um, it's somewhat um like from the topic of it's. We have been underestimated a lot, yeah, due to, um, I think, the gender and all of that, because people may, mainly feel like the male are the ones who are to basically do anything when it comes to sport. My question is, how do one actually make a bold step to actually make a name for themselves in media journalism? In, in my country. Question to whom? To Donna. To Donna. Donna, have you heard yeah, the question? Because she said, she said we, you can make a difference. So I want to ask if she can enlighten me a bit on that. Thank you. Thank you. Aria and Donna, we are listening to your answer. How do I end? There. Um, you know, the differences I've made, the activism started in the 60s and we're only seeing 
the results now. They're little steps, but um, making a difference had to be on many levels uh, with your federation, with the, your U.S. Olympic Committee. Um, if you want a, a cultural change, you have. We, we did research that drew the line between, um, and my focus was mostly athletes, women athletes getting an opportunity. <laughs> Um, we did the research on the health benefits because there's some countries they don't see a competitive women athlete as valuable. So sometimes you have to pitch your story differently about the health benefits. We're, we're in a health crisis worldwide because of the food, because we don't exercise. Uh, and the, there's a direct correlation between activity and um, uh, your health, whether it's depression, whether it's the ability to have the endurance to, to, to support your family as a homemaker or as a professional. I mean, I, you have to, what we did was we approached it on so many levels. And what we did was we convened very progressive men and women and elite athletes to help us. If you look in the United States now with all the disruption and the, the, the controversies and the activism, you're, gonna, you're seeing top athletes step up to try to bring peace and calm our country by uh, reaching out to kids. Um, and, and they are the role models that you can, you can promote to tell your story, to get them to join you in giving out messages. But it's, it's a very comprehensive work we did from government to federations, to convening spokespeople, to coming up with policy, to doing research. And, it never happens quick enough, but I'm often asked, you know, why our women do so well in the Olympics? Well, we passed a federal law in 1972 that we still have to defend that said you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex in any institution that receives money from the government. So whereas our women had no sports scholarships and no college programs in the 70s, that opened the door uh, for women to not only go attend college, and many women from inter other countries have come to the U.S., but to get an education and move through the system in a much more progressive way. But we always, just because you pass a law, it doesn't mean it's enforced. So we had to go through um, challenges to our federal government and to go through our, uh, our, our civil courts to get these schools to do what the federal government wanted them to do. So I know that's complicated, but you got to, it's important to work on all levels. And then to tell the stories of those people that are the, putting themselves on the front line to make change. Yes, Donna, thank you. Agree with you. And uh, I had an information uh, from our technical side that uh, Subod Malabarun, the president of Indian uh, Sports Journalist Association, is again with us. Subod, we are listening to you. Uh, hello. Uh, Hello, I am very impressed with, uh, with this uh, seminar and especially Verona's uh, speech. So thank you on, on behalf of us. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm glad that you like it. Uh, also, I think that our uh, EC, Executive Committee member, Zhuzha Chistu, like, likes it because she also wants to tell something. Zhuzha? Yes, thank you, Yura. Uh, all I wanted to say is that I'm really happy that I can be uh, basically a member of uh, uh, the Executive Committee of AIPS in an era when we really try to pay attention and reach out to female colleagues. And as I had the great chance, thankfully, to AIPS to meet uh, an absolute role model, a pioneer, Donna De Varona, and she was, uh, she was, uh, I could get uh, the chance to get to know her life, and I even had the chance to make a feature story about her in Hungary uh, to our newspapers, to our magazines. Uh, obviously, I had the wow effect that she's got this fantastic life, but uh, listening to this uh, absolutely amazing stories from all over the world today, I think one of the most important uh, reactions that I had is that uh, 
you can recognize your own story no matter where you go which continent which country which is very very important because then you can have sort of a feel of a strength of us that uh, every one of us is facing the same sort of problems you all had to face that kind of difficulties uh, those discriminations those uh, obstacles in your field and if we if we have uh, uh, initiatives like this when we can find each other, uh, even through, uh, thankfully to the, to the technical support, obviously, uh, if we can find each other, then I think it's, it's a, definitely a step forward. So uh, thank you for sharing these fantastic stories. And I think we still have a lot to tell in the upcoming uh, three seminars besides this. Yes, of course, together with you, because you will be one of the panelists. So thank you very much, Juja. Okay. Now we are going to Congo. Francine is with us. Francine from Congo. Not yet. Maybe Miriam Bracho from Venezuela. Hola. Hello, Miriam. Oh, your connection is very poor. But okay, we are listening. Okay. Talk. Oh, Miriam, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, but your connection is very, very poor. Let, we will try to make it better and I'll call you later. Now we are going to, again, India. Hazarika from India. Sorry, Miriam, again for this. Hazarika from India. Hazarika also had some problems as i see sorry to hear that elizabeth from ecuador ecuador do you hear us oh soy. yes thank you okay uh bueno gracias eh, realmente por por hacer estos eventos, son muy interesantes y veo conectada a una amiga y gran colega, eh, Marta Córdoba, que me, me invitó a esto y gracias otra vez. Mi pregunta es para Viviana, eh, escuché el, su experiencia. Eh, ¿Es importante que dependa de nosotras el que podamos tener mayor eh, presencia en los medios de comunicación deportiva? Eh, yo hago periodismo deportivo por ocho años y ha sido complicado, he logrado llegar. Pero depende de nosotras, las mujeres, o en su mayoría de los hombres eh, que forman parte de este medio, y vale la redundancia, su mayoría en, en, en el periodismo deportivo. Eh, estoy haciendo un proyecto que se llama El diario de una periodista deportiva, eh, con esta iniciativa de que las mujeres que formamos parte de esto podamos contar nuestra historia y nuestras experiencias. Y ha sido muy interesante porque ha llamado la atención también de ellos. Miriam, tu respuesta, por favor, ¿de quién depende más? ¿De nosotras o de ellos que nos den el espacio? Ok, Vivian, maybe, uh, not maybe, but please answer on this. Viviana. Ahí está, está, estaba esperando que me habiliten el micrófono. Yo estaba dispuesta aquí. ¿Correcto? Ok, bueno. Ok. Ok. Eh, mirá, eh, gracias por tu consulta. La mayoría de los varones, hombres, son quienes deciden en los medios de comunicación. Ellos deciden propuestas de trabajo, eh, la gran mayoría, ¿no? Deciden, dirigen los canales, dirigen revistas, diarios. Entonces ellos diseñan qué quieren comunicar y eligen también las personas eh, que van a trabajar en sus proyectos. Y hay diferentes parámetros. No es lo mismo el diario este, que la televisión, donde además del talento exigen las cualidades físicas este, o la apariencia física, es diferente la radio también, por supuesto. Yo creo que la gran batalla nuestra es 
seguir levantando la voz, seguir saliendo a decir que estamos aquí presentes, que ya no estamos solas, que nosotros tenemos la misma capacidad, la misma igualdad de trabajo, el mismo talento para hacerlo y la misma capacidad de poder pensar el análisis de un juego, el relato de un juego, eh, el, el análisis o lo que sea en cualquiera de las plataformas. Tenemos que estar eh, visibilizándonos todo el tiempo, porque la gran mayoría de los que deciden siguen siendo hombres. Yo no tengo la fórmula mágica, solo sé que pude mostrar mi trabajo estando todo el tiempo en acción y pidiéndole a las mujeres que no se desanimen, que sigan con su pasión, que el camino que hayan elegido nunca lo traicionen y que no busquen fama, que busquen prestigio en cada una de sus actividades. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana, and thank, thanks for the question. Now we are going back to Australia. Izar Khan is with us. Izar. Hi, good afternoon all. Can you hear me? Yes. And see you. Yes, my question to Tracy is, uh, this is related to the gender um, uh, discrimination towards the leadership leadership position in the media house. So my question is, there is a leadership gender gap in media industry continues and how this is going to be improved? We can see that there is only one female top boss out of 25 organizations in the world. This is just an example. Uh, also, men still receive 62% of bylines and other credits in print, online, TV, and wire news, and have 84% of the last century's Pulitzer Prizes. So all the top prizes are, gonna, are winning by the men's, uh, by the male, and not the female. Is this... Uh, Uh, is this uh, uh, due to the lack of the commitment or is a gender discrimination? Thanks. Any special uh, person to ask this question or to all of them? All of them, anybody. Thanks. Oh, okay. Let's start with Maria Angeles and Perio Martin. Can you answer this? Because it is uh, more than just sport journalism. If Maria is still with us. Sí, la verdad es okay. que yo creo que antes comenté que lo importante es que las diferentes organizaciones de periodistas tengan esto claro, se dirijan a los gobiernos para que tomen norma, haya normativas que beneficien la igualdad salarial, lo primero, y el mismo acceso a los puestos directivos, y luego también eh, buscar un poco la complicidad de los propios compañeros, de los colegas eh, masculinos. Yo creo que eso es importante. No, no verlos nunca como rivales, sino como alguien que puede valorar tu trabajo, que trabaja contigo y que te puede apoyar a la hora de un ascenso, ¿no? Y, y por supuesto las empresas, yo creo que las organizaciones tenemos que presionar a las empresas para que elijan a los posibles directivos en base a sus méritos, a su preparación, a sus posibilidades de organizar bien una redacción y no aunque sean hombres, aunque sean mujeres, a que sean viejos, a que sean jóvenes, sino buscar las mejores personas para, para que estén en los puestos directivos. O sea, que las mujeres hacen el mismo esfuerzo que los hombres para llegar a estos puestos, no tener que demostrar que somos mejores cada día para que realmente te vean como una posible directiva. ¿no? Eh, desde el Consejo de Género este tema estamos trabajando en ello desde hace mucho tiempo y la verdad que creemos que se ha avanzado bastante pero que todavía hay mucho camino que conseguir y para ello es necesario que nosotras mismas eh, seamos capaces de, de, de tener ese liderazgo, de luchar contra esta brecha salarial y de contar, insisto, con la complicidad de nuestros compañeros masculinos. Thank you for this. Inas uh, from Egypt, do you have anything to add? I think you can. Inas? No, she is maybe not with us. Mute. Yes. Yes, yes you I are here. Be. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, uh, in my country, it's, uh, it's a different situation because as long as you work uh, like uh, not only in, uh, in sports or in media or in newspapers, but in general, if you are working in the government uh, and accordingly, all uh, newspapers, uh, state newspapers, uh, television, everything, you have the pay, uh, the, pay uh, the salaries are the same. There is no difference between women 
and men, no gaps. But you can find these gaps in the private sector. In the private sector, they can decide. Sometimes uh, a sports presenter might, uh, according to her, uh, uh, to being a celebrity or not in the, in, the, in the field of sports media, she can earn more than her male colleague. It depends on your uh, pro professionalism. Uh, but in, in, in my newspaper, for example, we receive our salary according to the year of our graduation, not even the uh, experience. That's, it. That's the situation here. Thank you very much, Inas. Uh, uh, as we have uh, 10 minutes more, I think Izar is uh, satisfied with uh, those answers. We will not ask everybody. So we are going further. Hazarika from India is again with us. Hazarika, we are listening to you. Or maybe she's not. Hazarika from India. Hi, good evening Hi. to all of you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, ma, thank you so much AIPS for giving us this wonderful platform and thank you to all the expert panelists for giving us your motivating speech. Uh, my question will be to Tracy Holmes. Uh, good evening, Tracy. Um, I know you have been doing a wonderful job. You have been mentoring a lot of young people uh, through the Young Reporters Program. We get to see a lot of young women, you know, enrolling themselves for the mass communication courses, but we find 1% of female journalists who wants to be a sports journalist. What is your one advice to those young people who really wants to take up sports uh, journalism as a career? Tracy. Tracy Holmes. Hi, Hazarika. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great to see you. It, um, it's been a long time since I've seen Thank you, but it's lovely to see you there tonight. So great for joining Thank in. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy. Um, Thank you. And look, I think you could offer as much adv as advice as I can offer. Um, but I just think it's the same that it doesn't matter which position you want to be in. It doesn't matter if you want to follow politics. It doesn't matter if you want to follow sport. It doesn't matter if you want to follow current affairs. Um, it, it needs the passion, it needs the drive, it needs the desire to want to go that extra length. And also what it requires is what some of the other speakers have said tonight, I think belief. Because if you can see yourself there, it's going to be much easier for you to be able to convince other people that they can see you there as well. And I think a lot of the questions that we've had tonight, it's kind of relevant to this. And I think, um, you know, even the question before yours as well. Sometimes we don't see enough women, um, but it's not just women. Sometimes we don't see enough other minorities. You know, I live in a country, I'm really lucky, it's the most multicultural country in the world. Uh, we have people from every country here. And yet when I turn on the news, I see only white people. So it's not just a male and female thing. There's, there's a lot of people who are not being represented. And I think sometimes we have to stop looking at ourselves in different compartments and we just have to see ourselves as humanity and um and we give the jobs to the best people and we share that around and we encourage other people and uh, i think an environment like that is going to foster a much better outcome thank you tracy another question you, tracy. will be for you from rafik mohammed rafik uh, are you with us uh, please join us and uh, ask your question to tracy uh hi tracy uh my question is uh, about the uh, women world cup which held uh, which, uh, in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand. How you will cover this uh, great competition and what's your plan? <laughs> uh, well, my plan probably doesn't matter. It's uh, the people that are gonna be the rights holders. Um, we just hope that this whole COVID-19 situation um, can be dealt with by then so that we can welcome the world. We had a fantastic experience here for the 2000 Olympic Games where we really did welcome the world and everybody that came had a community here in Australia because we have people from every country and we hope that the Women's World Cup, we, we want to take it to another level. 
We want to welcome the world again. There's going to be twice as many teams competing as the last Women's World Cup in 2019 in France. And um, that World Cup really took women's football to this level. And then here in New Zealand and Australia, we want to take it to that level. Uh, and we hope that you can be here to enjoy that as well. Thank, Thank you, Tracy. Thank, Thank you, Rafik. Uh, one last question, Anna Patricia Rivas, or something to say, some idea or maybe opinion. Anna Patricia Rivas. Hola, me escucha? Hola. Hola, mi nombre es Ana Patricia, soy de Venezuela. Cuando hablamos del periodismo deportivo, y de la mujer es algo que llama la atención, porque hemos visto las primeras mujeres que se convierten comentaristas, analistas de algunos deportes. En mi caso, me convertí la primera mujer en narrar fútbol acá en Venezuela para la televisión y la radio. No fue nada fácil, recibí muchos mensajes negativos de los hombres y hasta en los partidos. Eh, tuve una, un problema grande que eso me afectó mucho en mi carrera que no aceptaban que yo narrara fútbol y el, el hombre se me vino encima a golpearme porque no podía aguantar escuchar a una mujer narrar fútbol ¿cómo se hacen esos casos aquellas mujeres que se convierten las primeras en hacer cosas diferentes que no estamos acostumbrados a ver? Whom do you ask? To Viviana? A quien está hablando? A Viviana. Viviana, sí. Viviana. Me tienen que habilitar ustedes el micrófono. Ahí está. Yes, we are. Muy bien. <laughs> Eh, gracias por la consulta, te admiro profundamente que puedas eh, ser relatora, eh, eh, como le dicen, narradora también, de partidos. En Argentina no existe y es absolutamente brutal lo que tenemos que pasar. Yo fui la primera que masivamente en mi país comentó partidos de fútbol analizó partidos de fútbol en vivo, ya no en presentar noticias o en un programa ya realizado o sobre el juego ya terminado, sino en vivo en la transmisión del partido, he sido la primera y la única, porque yo ya no estoy en la televisión argentina haciendo este trabajo y no tuve reemplazo, fui la única en este país que comentó fútbol en vivo. Y me acuerdo lo que dijo Tracy temprano hoy, el rol cruel de las redes todo lo que dicen, todo el maltrato que nos lleva a pasar una vida muy cruel y muy fea. Lo que contás de la violencia física es un espanto que eh, me asombra, me enoja, pero no me hace bajar los brazos. Lo que tenemos que hacer es denunciar estas situaciones de violencia porque los hombres no soportan que podamos encontrar nuestro espacio. Los hombres tienen garantizado todas las oportunidades solo por ser hombres. Se los cuestiona por otras cosas, no por ser hombre, sino este, porque puedes no gustar de algo que hacen. A nosotras nos cuestionan por cómo somos físicamente, por ocupar un espacio que no nos correspondía, por la ropa que tenemos puesta, por cómo decimos algo, por el tono de nuestra voz, por la forma de relacionarnos, por todo. Y sobre nosotras, yo lo dije, hay una lupa muy grande, y como decía Tracy, las redes sociales, que son muy buenas para muchas cosas, nos estamos encontrando en esta plataforma, hacen este, desarmar la, la carrera de cualquier persona si no estamos muy firmes. No somos tan fuertes, nos convertimos en fuertes para poder sobrellevar esta situación. Así que no decaigas, seguí haciéndolo, juntate con mujeres que te acompañen y juntate con hombres que sepan respetar, pero no le des el gusto y no te retraigas. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Viviana. Thank you all. We came uh, to the end of this uh, first seminar, and I hope uh, these seminar uh, sessions will help all of you to be better in the in the work that you are doing, uh, either women or men. 
but uh, at the end, I will just uh, ask uh, our president, Mr. Merlo, to finish this session and to announce uh, the other one at Thursday. Thank you. So, first of all, I must thank everybody. I must thank all the panelists that... Uh, sorry, I have some problem with no, the... No, 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 yes. Now, I think that uh, was a, a very interesting experience. This first step in the seminar for women. And I think that this is only the appetizer because in the next uh, session, we will go deeper in the problem that today we have spoken a little bit because the problem is that uh, next time we have to speak about the forgotten after the cut pay because we, we, somebody has also spoken about the salaries but for the end of the problem of the backlash, gender backlash that is the most important and the most difficult and we have already received many letters and many uh, I can say any experience, very bad experience of some of our colleagues that they have lived a, a difficult situation and sometimes even violence. So we have to continue to fight for the parity of gender. And I think that it's very important that you were here today with us. We will continue because what makes me very optimistic is that there was, a, we have registered people from more than 100 countries that will follow us in these four days, beginning from next Thursday. So in 24 hours, there is a, a new meeting between us. And before to say you buy, I want to show you the video that for technical problem, we were not able to show you before, that is the promotion of the third edition of the IPS Sport Award. Okay, now we are done. We are at the end uh, and see you on Thursday, 2 o'clock p.m. Central European time. Be with us at least 40 minutes before. Thank you very much and goodbye from AIPS. Bye-bye.